Caitlin, thank you so much for coming on to the show. I really appreciate your time, especially later in the afternoon in, in on a Monday there and an early Tuesday here in Adelaide. Um, how are you going? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, there's a lot of excitement in my life right now. Um, I'm one of the GMs for the International Swimming League. And so we are pressing forward to have a season um, in about four weeks. Uh, we will head to a bubble in Budapest and our athletes will train and compete there for about six and a half weeks. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of logistics to make this come together. Uh, it's a lot of work, a lot on my plate. I am responsible for 32 athletes and eight staff members. Uh, so just making sure everybody's well and taken care of and just working on time management and self-health and uh, just getting all my ducks in the road to move forward. But I'm thrilled to be on your show. So thanks for having me. So what happened to the swimming season in with the virus? What happened there? Yeah, so here in the States, I mean, things shut down rather quick, quickly in the middle of March. It's kind of like one sport started uh, coming to an end for their season and all sports just followed suit. And then obviously with the postponing of the Olympics, uh, that meant the Olympic trials were going to be postponed as well. So it was kind of like the dominoes, dominoes effect, one thing after another, as far as shut, 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 postponed, postponed, and then obviously getting locked out of pools and training facilities. Uh, so athletes' worlds were turned upside down. In our league, we had plans that were all our schedule was all um, rotated around the Olympics. I was supposed to be in Paris right now for one of our first competitions. So we had to pivot and adjust. And um, I'm really proud of how the league has um, come up with a backup plan. Um, you know, obviously there's a risk involved, but there's also a risk now going to like the grocery store. So yeah. um, I, I'm excited for our athletes to be able to have something to look forward to. I think that's really important physically and mentally. I mean, this has been really hard mentally on a lot of swimmers as well. So what have you, is there anything you've done to sort of, I guess, help them out? Because I know swimmers, it is a lot of training. Like, and I was just explaining to you how I'd done a year of swim training and it, and it really blew me away <laughs> about the amount you have to do and the hours that it is. And, and there's no doubt that like any person in professional sport around the world, like that moment where whether you're injured, whether you're like locked out of your facility and you can't do it, it is a, it is a pain in the arse. And like you, you, you really want to, to do it every day, constantly do it. So how have they... Have they managed that mentally? Is there anything that you've done as, as GM to sort of facilitate, look after them and, and, and try and help them out? You know, more than anything, I'm just trying to be emotionally supportive. Um, I don't know if a lot of times athletes really truly get asked, well, how are you doing and what can I do to be there for you? I think that we are looked at as just strong individuals that, you know, just kind of press on every day, almost like machines or robots, you know, and I think that um, I'm, I'm a very compassionate leader. And so I just really try to just support my athletes just by like loving on them and supporting them and, and just being an ear to listen to and, um, and just trying to stay really positive. I feel like because I've been there before and because I did have obstacles in my career, you know, I have kind of like the veteran outlook or just experiences that I can draw from so i'm just trying to really lead by example of positivity and and keeping big picture really right i mean obviously we are so dedicated to our sport and we put so much time energy um and, and blood sweat and tears into it but ultimately this is this is a bigger picture right we're literally in the middle of a pandemic it affects yeah. the whole entire world and it affects the athletes and it it, it affects the non-athletes you know it, it affects the old the young and everything in between so i think it's just really important to keep perspective um, I, I have a sister that's been battling cancer in the middle of all this, like talk about perspective, oh, you know? Yeah. So I think that's really important that we kind of shed that other, the bigger picture image to our athletes. Cause I think it's easy to get wrapped into like, this is end all be all. And having been there and done that and now being in the real world, it's like, there is more to life. So I think more than anything, I just really trying to be just compassionate and just trying to just let them know that I'm a source of, what can I do for you? Yeah, was that that support there for you when you were up and coming? Yeah, absolutely. I was really blessed with really um, just very, very supportive, compassionate, and loving family members. My mom and dad are just the ideal sports parents. Uh, they're the complete opposite of like a stage mom, you know. Actually, my mom <laughs> really liked to find me cute bathing suits that match my my cap and goggles. So maybe a little bit of a stage mom, <laughs> um, but it's just more of a fashion sense. But then, um, you know, I had two older sisters and they're kind of like 
you know, you idolize your big siblings when you're younger. And then I had, you know, like I kind of mentioned, I had some obstacles in my career, I had a lot of injuries. So um, I had some incredible medical staff that helped me through a lot of the hard times, physical therapists and, and just my coaches. Cause I feel like a lot of times coaches are just like wanting you to perform your best at all times. They don't really seem to care if you're injured because you're no good to them. But I never had that experience with my coaches. They're all just really concerned of uh, of my health and my well-being and, and staying healthy for my sport throughout my whole career. Yeah, I think you can. I think you're right that that everyone being in this this issue and this pandemic at once. I think probably you could maybe fall into the trap that if I'm not training, then someone else is, is going to be training and, and actually go, well, no, they're locked out of their, their gym, <laughs> their, their pool as well. So they're, they're definitely not training. Like that's, yeah. that's probably a reality that maybe athletes would have to have a look at. And, and I think, yeah, that that's why I think it's a really great moment for reflection just to see where you're going like this little bit. I, I know it's dragged on and it's really going out and it could it could be going on for a lot longer, but it is it is a moment where we do get to slow down. We do get to see what where our goals are going and, and was I doing the right thing and stuff like that. And people I've spoken to, it, I think they struggle with that, but then there is that sort of sense that, okay, no, I can slow down. I can take my time and, and, and eventually see where I'm going, see where I'm heading. Yeah. Um, I really feel like there's like, a, you can always try to find a silver lining in any situation. So I feel yeah. like during this time more than ever, um, cause there have been some good things about it, you know, the slowing down and sitting down at home. And, you know, I think there have been some blessings, um, throughout all of this. I just think that's a really good life lesson is that although you feel like you're in the middle of a storm, like try to find that silver lining. Yeah. So you spoke about your parents not being sort of super on you. So when, when did, when did the, where did swimming come into your life? What was it always the goal to be a swimmer? Was it always the the career choice you wanted to take? Yeah, I mean, um, I was thrown into swimming at a really young age because I'm from Southern California and it's always sunny here and everybody's at the pool or the beach or a river or a lake. And um, having two older sisters that were already on a swim team when I was born, it was like I was two weeks old and already going to like their first or going to my first swim meet was their swim meet. Yeah. Uh, so just being surrounded by that environment. And then, you know, I was a huge water baby from a really young age. My parents couldn't even get me out of the bathtub. So I think <laughs> that is like a natural attraction to something, right? Because you see with children, either they really love the water or they're eh, not so much. And I was definitely like all in. Um, but yeah, I was very, um, it was very much a, a jock or an athlete growing up. And um, it wasn't just swimming. I did soccer and cross country and track and field. And I did dance and I was asked to be on a boys football team and, uh, you know, it, at the the level of just sports in my life was very consistent all the way to junior high. Um, and it wasn't until about the sixth, seventh grade where I realized it was like, it was time to pick one sport. Uh, I narrowed it down to soccer and swimming. And then I did a little, I still ran kind of like on the side because I didn't really need to be on a team. And I would just show up at like different like cross country matches or just like a lot of community races they would have on the weekends or for holidays. Uh, but uh, when it came down to it, Honestly, I probably liked soccer more, wow. uh, but it was like swimming. I kind of felt like I had more of a chance perhaps. Um, okay. And more than anything, like I was swimming to try to get a scholarship for college. Uh, and so I felt like I had the ability to take my swimming and see where it could take me as far as getting into schools. Uh, but I did like that swimming was more of an individual sport. I kind of liked that pressure on me. Um, and not that I'm not a team player, but I just felt like you really get to be in control of your destiny. Uh, whereas in soccer, when the other team scores a goal, it goes through how many people on the team, you know, so it's kind of like, a, I went through a lot of people, but yeah. so, I mean, like it's you, right? Like everything you're putting in and, you know, relays are a little bit different, but yeah. So it wasn't until about the time I got to high school and I got really serious about swimming and, um, made my first international competition when I was. 16 and they made my first olympic team actually when i was 17 so it all kind of like went rather quickly i guess that, you would that's say that's a fast forward track isn't it that's that's oh, a no. quick intro was there a, <laughs> was there a moment was there kind of like a pinnacle moment where you thought this is this is what i want to do this is this is actually a reality of being able to go there but also the fact that you had loads of different sports going on and a lot of young people will have a lot of different things and and i and i even have some some athletes I'm coaching out here where they're playing a lot of different sports is there a definitive decision that you or moment that you had where you were like right swimming done and then everything else moves aside and then it's a solid focus 
Uh, honestly, it was because I was starting to get hurt a lot in soccer. Um, so I was rather short for my age and really, really skinny, but I was super aggressive. So I would just be like, on the floor, <laughs> on the floor, bruised rib, <laughs> hurt knee, you know? And so my parents were trying to get rather nervous. And then my swim coaches, my club coaches, they were the first coaches to be like, yeah, it's probably about time you pick one sport. And they really just showed me or they... I guess the right word is that they just were like, you, you should be a swimmer. Like I, sh I saw their belief in me the most, you know? And it's like, and quite frankly, I was probably equally as good at soccer as I was for swimming, but it, my, my swim coaches were more, more vocal about me picking one sport and knowing that I had a lot to offer or shine. And so just following their belief and believing in them. Um, both of my club coaches had a rather successful swimming career themselves. So just like really knowing that they knew what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. So I say that was kind of like the turning point where my coaches were like, okay, it's time for you to pick. And then just on top of getting hurt quite often. Um, and then I guess I didn't, I, in high school, like I just did what I was told. Like I, I trained really hard. I did the sets my coaches said to do. Um, I didn't really think a lot about it. And I just loved to race. Like I loved to race. And anytime I got behind the blocks, I was just like, you are going down. Like I was just super locked in and really focused. And then um, I didn't really realize like I was really that good though, until I made that first international team. Uh, so I was 16 and I made kind of like our, our B squad at the Pan American games for 99. Mm. And then I went to that meet and I won both of my races and broke two Pan American records. And that's kind of like when the light bulb went off, I was like, huh, mm. <laughs> okay, <Yeah. laughs> this is a good sport for me. <laughs> yeah. and, and I know that sounds like so aloof and so like, oh my gosh, what, what, did this girl even know what was going on? But I, for me, that just really works well. Um, I don't put a lot of emphasis on stressing myself out as far as um, I got to go this time or, it's, you know, this is the time I need to get. Not to say I didn't set goals, but it was just like my goal every time I, I race was just, just like win and like race hard. And, yeah. but I just love to race so much that I felt like I didn't even really need to like pump myself up with like specific goals. I was just like, I cannot wait to dominate this weekend, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think just athletes are wired differently. Some athletes really need like a number or a goal. It's kind of funny. Like I'm terrible with numbers. Like they don't register with me. I'm more of like an English history speaker, read a book mm. opposed to like, let's do math problems. And so with swimming, like everything's numbers. I'm like, I don't even know my time right now. I don't even know the intervals right yeah. now. And so sometimes I think it's better to be that way, you know, because it's like, there's only so much you can control, do your best and go from there. Yeah, that's really interesting because it is st it's fairly statistical. It is literally <laughs> like, here's your splits. This is what you need to, this is the pace you need to be at. And I mean, it's the same sort of running, cycling, but like, yeah. yeah. I mean, so was there, there, there sounds like there was a lot of trust in your coaches initially. Like you trusted your coaches with, with, your, with your training, you trusted them with their, was there anything there that you sort of eventually evolved into sort of your own intuition but you were quite young you're explaining there you were quite young 17 at your first olympics mm -hmm. so i guess without sounding like you you probably didn't know too much of the sport by then it was just like right okay yeah. I'll, I'll i'll do that so was there any any amount of intuition that you had at the time and sort of oh no i'm i feel like this is or challenging the coaches a little bit maybe coming to them with a uh, i guess a solution to to your own problem uh, not really as far as stuff in the pool. Uh, one thing that, you know, my family and coaches, we didn't butt heads on. I mean, they were really understanding, but we, my parents were really adamant about my life wasn't going to be dominated by swimming. So I was really involved in school. I was like class president in yearbook and was on different clubs and uh, different activities in the community. And so, you know, my parents, they didn't always agree that I needed to be at every single swim practice or every single swim match. And you know, bending over backwards to be at like all these long competitions. And it's like, if I had other things that came up that like made me a, like a normal high school girl, my parents thought it was really like important for me to take part in that. So I think your club coach is like, no, you need to be here. And I'm like, no, I'm going to prom tonight, you know, or I'm going to the, the football game. And, and I'm really blessed and grateful for that, you know, because people ask me a lot, like, oh, did you feel like you missed out on so much? I'm like, no, like I went to a lot of it. I mean, of course I did. Like you can't do everything. But I felt like I had like a really healthy, normal high school because I didn't isolate myself and I didn't just put myself in a swimming bubble. So I think sometimes my coaches would have wished I would have been, 
you know, a little bit more all swimming, but in the end, like, so we're still great friends. It's like, yeah, it worked for you, you know? And, and that's when I saw my best when I wasn't all consumed by my sport. Cause I did try doing that the latter part of my career where all I was was a professional swimmer. And that's what I did. I wasn't in school, didn't have a job, like wasn't in too many activities. Mm. And I just, I just lost the love for it. I mean, I swam okay, but like, I just wasn't, I was kind of like, meh. And then my love just faded from that. So I, I'm the type of athlete that needs other things going on in my life. Um, and, and I would say, you know, <laughs> my family was very much like the coach's coach and the parent's parent. And then that's how I followed suit. You know, it's like, I listened to my coaches and I listened to my parents. Like I wasn't like this gnarly rebellious high school kid. I was so busy. I was in the pool and um, I'm just really grateful for the upbringing that I had at that, that stage of my life, because I know not a lot of people share as much joy when they look back on that adolescent training in their life. That's really, that is so true. Like that is something that I think almost, I think you should have as a blessing. Like that's something yes. that is, that is definitely a lot of people. I think I even went through that. I, there's definitely a lot. I sacrificed, um, my sport cricket. It, it does consume a lot of time to play in it. I mean, just playing one day of it is, is about eight, eight to nine hours sometimes that you're there. So you're not just going to the event and then coming back and then we do it over four days. So it's, it's, it's eight hours a day and then you might be traveling. So there is a moment where you're not only, you're just consumed by, we called it the treadmill. We literally called it, you were stuck on the treadmill and the, the, the circuit treadmill and you, you, you were just constantly going on that treadmill and then you, you very rarely got time off. But it sounds like you really got balance. And, and I was only speaking to someone about this last night and a young athlete asking me about how to balance work and, and school. And, and But he was being consumed by the whole pressure that he was putting on himself because he was just living it all the time. And I did see a development in my own game and my own practice when I was able to compartmentalize everything. And, and literally, like, when I'm at the, when I'm training, I'm training. And then when I'm done training, I'm not training. Okay. Um, and it really does sound like you've got that. And I encourage anyone that's trying to, do you know what, whether it's starting a business, whether it's starting, um, getting into a sport, like, find that time where you can, you can just switch the hell off and, and, it makes you less is more. I think there's, there's a serious amount of athletes that get towards the end of their careers and they always say less is more. Um, right. And I always wonder though, I always do, I do toss and turn over whether do you need that amount of, of, of like hard training when you're younger and then <laughs> you slowly take it off because otherwise you, you maybe don't stand out and you right. maybe don't get the opportunity. So it's a real, I, I don't know. I never really, I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Do you, do you feel if a, if a younger athlete had the older, wiser head, that is less is more, do they do better? I think definitely for recovery, for injuries and physically, but I wonder whether getting that drive and really being motivated in trying to go for a goal. So maybe sometimes you do, you do need that little blend of, yeah, I need to commit to a lot, a lot of it. Yeah. I think building the foundation at a young age is really extremely important because um, your body can take more at that age too, right? Mm, so on a physical yeah. side, I think, yeah, you need to put in that work um, as far as the physical foundation that you lay down. But I think the mental side is that you have to go less is more because then that's when the burnout starts. Yeah. You know, a lot of people get to college and they're like, oh, okay, I'm so over this. Well, because I just got worked for the last four years in high school with parents that were on top of them, club coaches that were on top of them, high school teachers that were on top of them. And it's like, you, you have, I, I, when I look back at my clothes, I mean, I have nothing but fond memories and like so much fun, even though I worked my ass off. But then by the time I got to college, I wasn't burnt out because we had such the balance. Right. And I just think you see the opposite or, you know, cause I, I was good when I was younger, but I wasn't like stellar standout. You see these kids that were really good at 11 and 12. And then when they're like 15, 16, they're so over it because they've had like a target on their back from such a young age and having mm. to deal with that at a young age is really hard on an athlete uh, mentally. Uh, so I think, yeah, I think the, the platform, or sorry, the foundation of the physical work needs to be heavy at a young age, but I think the mental, you want to keep your mind fresh and in a good spot so you can carry that longevity into your sport. Yeah, it sounds like you were having like that that amount of fun is just crucial. If you're not enjoying it, then it's then you've really got to point. question. Yeah, you've really got to question yeah. what you're doing. You did you did um, medley, so you did 
all the strokes was there one that you you preferred the most was there one that you were like this is the one I enjoy question uh you know it fluctuated a lot when I was really young I started out as a breaststroker and then by the end of my career it was my worst stroke um I would say across the board I always was like consistently good in freestyle and then when I got to stick like when I was 16 I started becoming a really strong butterflyer so freestyle and butterfly are probably the strokes I'm most fond with and oddly enough so Everybody always asks, oh, do you still swim? Do you still swim? I was like, I know I hardly ever get in the pool anymore. But it's so weird because when I do get in the pool, the stroke that feels the best for me is butterfly, which is the hardest stroke. And I'm like, why does this feel good right now? (laughs) It's the weirdest thing. And I I think I have like a really like, uh, like they say, like a very like natural sound stroke and just like very technical sound stroke. Uh, just like a real natural feel in the water. And butterfly is like such like a, a full body motion that I think it's just like, I don't know. Everybody's like calls me a mermaid. So I think it's my mermaid skills that just kind of keep me through the water. <laughs> I think that was the thing that I learned the most when I went into the pool and transferred into swimming was that um, a lot of people probably associate swimming with subtle drowning. And they, they there's a lot of swimmers that you see that are just like amateurs and, and they their, their techniques all over the place. And, and I remember Ron, like he was such a good coach for me. Like he got me in and, and I was, I'd just been a professional athlete. So he was kind of like, look, you are literally back down to basics here. And it was such a humbling experience being thrown floats, fins, like flippers like literally like everything to get me to go and and yeah and technically it's snorkel and I'm I'm sitting over going like there's 18 year old kids that are flying over there and like I'm in all of this equipment and um and like what what like what's going on and and I thought this is crazy like how am I how am I going to get better at swimming with all this equi- equipment on? Because when I take it off, I'm going to feel dreadful. But oh my God, trusting that process was the best thing I ever did because there's that there's that moment where you go from probably stroking into the water and feeling like you're being resisted by the water and then stroking into water and, like, and feeling like there's this almost collaboration with you in the water where you are gl- you are literally gliding yeah. and it's such a it's such a good feeling I, I again if anyone who is wants to get into swimming like go get a coach to work on your technique because swimming changes when you you yeah. get that how much of your um how much of your training when you were working is is on on technique i recently spoke to um, Zach Bitter, ultra runner, and also Dan Lawson recently, another GB ultra runner. We were speaking about how much of their training was at um, at a lower intensity, so lower intensity, really getting a base of fitness. Was it the is it the same in swimming, or is it a little bit harder because of breathing? You're underwater, you gotta hold your breath, and yeah. So what what what's your training sort of like as you're growing up, and and the intensities to technique and stuff like that? Right. Uh, you know, I think <laughs> in swimming while we're in practice if the coach was like we're going to work on technique today we'd all be like yes because that <laughs> transfers to e- easy and yeah. so we didn't get it very much to tell you the truth and it's kind of um because i did some coaching after swimming and it's basically you do technique at a really young age or you do technique for private coaching but when you go to a team or like a, a group workout no you just get pounded yeah. Um, yeah. when we got to the university level, I mean, we would have like a technique coach and oh my gosh, everybody would be like, oh, pick me, pick me. Cause they would like pull you out of the water and you get to miss practice and go look at video and stuff. But it was like, <laughs> again, that equaled easy workout if you got yeah. to work on technique. So, um, luckily at the university I went to, we had a really fantastic technique coach and, um, I just take direction really well and I learned really well on video. Um, and I can make changes pretty, pretty quickly. Um, but like, I, I feel terrible like bragging about this, but I, I just had a really great technique. So it just came, obviously I worked on it, but it came pretty natural to me. Um, I understand what I need to do to make myself go forward. I have a really strong catch of the water, a really um, very hypermobile shoulders, which allow me to get to a 90 degree angle really quickly and have very hyper, um, like uh, what's it called? Um, like double jointed knees. So my knees go backwards. So it really helps yeah. when I kick. Uh, so yeah. I have a lot of these things going for me, uh, which <laughs> ironically out of the water kind of makes me hurt more, <laughs> but <laughs> in the water, it really kind of just, again, like those mermaid vibes um, in the pool. So yeah, I feel like the technique part of training for swimming starts at a younger age, but it fades really quickly because if, you know, most swim practices have 30 to 40 kids, like a coach can't like specifically give you that technique training. Um, but, you know, my parents did help me, you know, with the tools because I would get some uh, private technique lessons at a young age 
Um, and then, you know, with club coaches and club coaching and in the high school age, it's, it's kind of on that coach. It's, they have to work more when they do that, right? They have to be dedicated more. And we definitely got that um, at the team I was on because it was a rather small club team. And then it, it transferred over a little bit in college. But other than that, it's just time to pound you. Yeah. <laughs> yardage, yardage, yardage. Oh, threshold <laughs> sessions and stuff like that. They were the worst. Like that, they, they, the whole idea of like elephants on your shoulders, that is a real thing. Yes. Um, but when, so we, you spoke about it briefly about your goals and how you, you kind of didn't really set any was there a moment where, where you was there a moment where you actually did start to set goals it may be in between the olympics the first and the second one but if yeah. you if you were setting goals was there a strategy and i'm always keen to find out like how people set their goals and the ways in which they structure it especially in olympics as well because of that four year four year period yeah, I mean, it's a really good point, the four-year period, because that's like a really challenging four years mm. because it's hard to stay like, at that that high for so long. Uh, but it's also hard to really grind that long for four years too. But uh, honestly, when I made my first Olympic team, immediately my second goal was, my first goal was to make a second team. So as soon as I got a taste of what 2000 Olympics was like, I was like, I want to do that again. So that goal was immediately, let's do it again. Um, and then my two years following my first Olympics was just really rough. I was hurt. I was broken down. I was, um, got sick a lot. Um, so that was a tough, tough go for me. And then basically the goal was just to get healthy again. Uh, the goal was to get my form back so I could be in contention for a second Olympic team. Um, and then when things started kind of clicking and coming back together, uh, right around, you know, a year and a half out from my the Olympic trials, I was getting really stuck at a, at a, a time for in the 400 I am, which was my best race. And it was a plateau. Like every time I raced, I was like at four minutes and 40 seconds. So I, I had this goal and, and it wasn't even very specific. Like literally it was break 440. It's because I've been so stuck at this plateau. Like I would have taken like a 439.99 that was my goal. And that was like a personal goal. Obviously my coaches knew that, but I was just so frustrated in this event that I was like, ah, if I don't break this, I'm just not going to do this race anymore. And it was my best race. And it was like really frustrating to not go a best time for like almost like four and a half years. Uh, so it, things kind of started falling into place because I got healthy, which was one of my goals. I was back on track, which was a goal. I ended up making my second Olympic team, which was a goal. And then at my second Olympics, I smashed the 440 barrier and I was like, check. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I think, I think it's okay to have like pretty broad goals. You know, I don't think it needs to be down to the 10th, hundredth millisecond. Um, I just think we have to be realistic and you know, what's going to make you happy. And for me, I was going to be happy to be healthy again. And I was going to be really happy to be at the second Olympics again. And I'll be really, really happy breaking this time and, and doing a, a PR. But I think one of the best advice I could give somebody training is just always set a goal to do your best. And that's why when I would go to a meet, I wouldn't set a specific time other than go a best time because you've never been that fast before. So even if it's this much faster, like just a, a fraction, like half of the fingernail, you've never been that good before. So you should be happy with that. Like, why would you be disappointed if it wasn't like two seconds faster? I mean, sometimes you have to be like, take baby steps and you can't get selfish and you can't get so like wrapped up in, in not thinking big picture because I think too, as you get older and as, and, and as you get pretty good, it gets even harder to be better. So you need to celebrate those small, like inner, you know, personal victories of being the best that you've ever been before. Um, and I don't think you should like compare yourself to others. Like you just, you can't control the uncontrollables and obviously set a goal of winning, but like at the same time, like if you do your best time, but you get third, you should still embrace that. Yeah, that that's really interesting as well. And I think that can definitely be, regardless of the, the sport and what you're doing, that you can very easily look over to the other lane, essentially, and see someone else going and and f forgetting that where you see your progression, where you see your own progression, your own individual progression. And, and that is, is something that I don't think people should lose sight of. It's very easy with whether it be social media or everything, we're getting thrown <laughs> thrown everyone's info and I'm doing well at this, I'm doing well at that. And, and you're like, well, 
okay, hold on a minute. I, I need to look at where, where was I yesterday? Am I a little bit better than I was yesterday? Am I a little bit better than then? And then that allows your your progression to to move forward f- for sure, for sure. Um, the the one thing with swimming as well is that it is incredibly physical. So it's mm-hmm. it's so on the physical side. But what do you believe differentiates if you've got swimmers that are sort of all around the physical same sort of um, category and, and standard? Then mm-hmm. where, where is that differentiation on the mental side of swimming? What do you believe sort of gives you that difference of kind of making Olympic squad um, or not making Olympic squad? Is there a, is there a mental difference in, absolutely, in those two? Absolutely, absolutely. I get asked all the time, like, what do you think the difference between a good and great swimmer is? I'm like, mental. All it is yeah, is mental. Okay. Because I feel like we, I think you just touched on it. Like a lot of swimmers are in the same physical pool um, as far as they're putting in the hard work in the weight room. They're putting in the yardage in the pool. They're doing amazing things um, physically. But, and obviously that gets you really far, right? There are some athletes that are just, whoa, you are a beast, you know, or you are just so, so supreme and like the way you're even built for our sport. But I think when it comes down to it, it's mentally who's up for this challenge, who's up for the training, who's up for continuing to go when things aren't going great, like who's up for, you know, overcoming obstacles. Um, And that's something like when I was talking to my athletes that are on my ISL team, it's kind of like, we're all in the same boat, but how you handle this is who's going to come out on top. You know, it's like, we've all been dealt the same cards this season. So who mentally is going to be the strongest competitor coming out of this? And I think that's what it is in in all of sports and and really life. It's like best attitude wins. Right. And it's like, it's like people that think money is going to make them happy and then they get the money and they're not happy. And it's like, it wasn't money. It's your attitude. Like what was money going to do for you? Right. And, and you can use that for like kind of anything down the way. And, and something that I've noticed being, you know, being a swimmer, being retired and being a coach and being a GM, there's just like a fire in athletes that either you have or you don't. And I honestly, I don't think you can teach it. I think you're Mm -hmm. born with it. I think you can help bring it out in people, but like you see it, like I I had a team of like 200 kids and I could literally point out who had it after one day of practice. And it's, yeah, I don't know if I can like really uh, use the right words for it, but it's like, it's, you can see it. I, I 100% what you're getting, uh, where you're going with that. And, and the thing that I think sometimes, um, I guess, frustrates me is when you have an athlete who almost kids themselves on it. <laughs> and they, they, well, they say like, I want to turn pro. And it's like, <laughs> well, you, okay, you want to turn pro, but here's your actions that you're doing. Here's actually what you're, this is how you're going to, going about it. Yeah. And I think you are right. I think there are some people that are just wired initially, whether it be sort of genetically or whatever, that it just flicks a switch and then that turns on and then they go hell for leather and then that's it. They're, they're at it. And the others, there might be, and it's the little things like excuses creep in little, little reasons why not to do something. Oh no, I was at this, I would, this is why this didn't go my way or rather than the other ones just kind of like push it aside and go, right, how am I going to get better? That that's the next thing I want to focus on and, and next goal, next training session and push, push, push. Right. Um, and it is, it is, it is something that I definitely, whether it's in your upbringing, whatever it is, it, it, it comes out naturally and it's, it's within you somewhere. It's kind of cool to see though, too. It's kind of like so cool interesting to take it, like, like kind of just observe yeah it is it is really really cool um do you how much do you still coach now do you enjoy your coaching um you know i i I do a handful of private coaching at this time which i do enjoy because more than anything it's a nice excuse to get out of the house and be by a pool and be in the sunshine right now um as my role as general manager i am on my computer and on my phone like all day Uh, so it's just kind of a nice way to get out of the house um, and take in some sunshine and and be around some like youthful energy. Uh, but no, I, I gave up coaching when I took on this job with ISL about a year and a half ago. Um, and, and my level for coaching is definitely more of the, the, the beginning stages. I took over the program basically in my hometown where I, I first learned to love swimming and do swimming. So more of a summer league program and a community program um, because I'm more of like <laughs> the fun type. I'm not the serious type. And um, I just really wanted to emphasize everything that we kind of talked about 
today, just attitude and, and the love for the sport and appreciating the sport and more than anything, just like exercise, like getting these kids like to be like outside and working out and offer their phone. And it's like, for me, it was, I had just different importances on things that I wanted to stress for Slovene. And I, you know, I wouldn't be like the, the college level or the national team coach. I'm more of the, the fundamental coach, but at the same time, I'm very in tune with technique. Uh, but at the same, I, I like around when they're like eight to 10 years old and older, I am not like the learn to swim two, three year olds. So that was kind of my, my little niche. <laughs> yeah, that that's, that's, uh, that's amazing. You mentioned you had injuries as, as well. Um, mm-hmm. What sort of injuries did you get? And then how were you, how were you mentally dealing with those injuries as well? I think more the the physical side sometimes can almost does take care of itself. And I believe that you, you do the rehab, you get back high percentage chance you're going to get better unless it's career ending. Um, but it's really, I, I guess, how people face that adversity, that 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 challenge of of not being able to do what they want to do. How was how did you go about doing it? What were the injuries you got as as well? Everything on my right side, which is so weird. It was right shoulder, wow. right side of my back, right knee. Uh, shoulder was uh, bicep tendonitis and uh, the, just the repetition of the sport so so common with swimming and that that like you said you just kind of you, you work your way through that it's just mm. pt shoulder strengtheners rest stem ice you know <laughs> advil um, <laughs> and then the back injury was the most severe i had a stress fracture in my intercostal muscles uh, so that one that one was lengthy that was almost career ending just because um, how do you heal that you, you mm. literally have to completely walk away from your sport and um, I also had asthma. So every time I would cough, it would always, you know, pull apart the intercostal muscles, which made it very hard to heal. So that one was a two part thing. I had to get my asthma under control in order for my back to heal. Then I had to allow my back to heal. Uh, and that one was hard. That one was tough. That one was frustrating. It was kind of a mystery injury in the beginning. Nobody really knew what it was. It took a really long time to get diagnosed. Um, I tried just to push through it. I swam with like tape on my back. Like I, it was, it was ugly. It was not good. Um, and then my right knee was, um, just off of a flip turn, like two months before trials. Uh, um, and, and that was when I thought I was going to have to have surgery for, and then my, my trainers were like, just once you're done with swimming, I really think we can rehab through this. And sure enough, I rehab through that one. Um, so through, through swimming, I had some good stuff. And as soon as I was done, I ended up having, um, Munford surgery because the end of my collarbone went dead. So I had part of my collarbone removed. And then once they were in there, they saw bone spur. So we had that taken out. Um, and then I shattered my wrist snowboarding after a stunt too. Oh. So I've had a kind of a good go. I'm actually in a boot right now of a fracture in my foot. Uh, oh, so it's no. kind of like the, the blessing in disguise. I have very loosey goosey body parts, which was great for swimming, but it kind of backfires on land. <laughs> yeah. So how did you, where did your mind go throughout those injuries? Like what, Those were hard. What, what was the, what was the big, big challenge for you, I guess? Yeah, I honestly, like one of the biggest challenges is that when I was, the shoulder one, that one was easy. It's not that it was easy. That one was just like, I don't know one somewhere that hasn't experienced that. Yeah. Um, that's just like patience and listening to a PT and letting your, having your coach believe you that you need to take some time off. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the back one was hard. The back one was really hard. And, and I think the hardest part was in the beginning, nobody knew it was wrong with me. So I'm like, do you think I'm making something up? It was like this mystery injury that literally took my breath away. Uh, and then on top of that, like I, I put on a lot of weight during that because I couldn't train. Um, I was really upset. I feel like I was like eating donuts way too often. <laughs> um, and then, and then the, the mental part started taking a toll too, because mentally I was always super strong and I would race anybody any, any day, any time, any place, like bring it. But then when I was going through this injury, this injury, it's kind of like I started second guessing myself and wondering if I'd ever be good again and wondering if I would, my body would be ready to perform again, or if I would get back to like, you know, competing form and, and, and girls that I would be easily were like starting to swim faster. I was like, Oh my gosh, like, Oh man, am I gonna be able to beat her again? So that was the first time I ever felt like my mental game starting to slip is when I was mm-hmm. going through this back injury. Um, and then all that really took from me though, obviously once I started physically feeling better, which is like a whole nother story, what I had to go through. Uh, But the mental side, I just needed one really, really good swim meet and I was back. And and I did that. Like I had a meet where I was like, damn, I got this. Um, And and it came back rather quickly. Um, Obviously the physical side took much, much longer than that, but I was really grateful that the mental side came back. And then um, the knee injury was hard because it was like literally the last two months of my career. And I was just I was already at a point, like put a fork in me, I'm done. And then really? when I was about this part, I was like, oh, damn, can I hold on for like two more months? 
And then ironically, I ended up getting really, really sick two weeks before the Olympic trials that same year. I got a severe upper respiratory infection and it was like kind of right then and there. It's like, oh man, I'm done. Um, I still went to my last Olympic trials in 2008, even though I knew that was going to be my last swim meet. Um, I was hoping I was going to make three Olympics, but it, it just didn't happen that way. But I was just really ready to be done. And I think my body was showing that I needed to be done also. Yeah, I think with the with when you get injured injured or you're you're having a bit of a challenge going on, getting those small wins is is a real real big thing. Like you said, getting back in the pool, getting a win that may not be an actual competition for some people, but it may also be just I don't know seeing that progression in in training or or just something that just gives you might be pushing a little bit more extra weight in the gym, just something that you're moving forward. So try and finding those 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 quick wins. Was there? Was there a way in which you tried to stay positive throughout there? Was there anything you would tell yourself or anything that you would sort of, yeah, like mantras or something like that that would that you would um, keep yourself positive? Honestly, my hardest injury was while I was in college and I just needed to go home a lot. I needed to be with my mom and dad and my sisters and just there's nothing like being home, especially like when you're in like a dorm room or like a crappy apartment and you're, you're eating gross food, you know? So um, I just needed the TLC of being home and being around such supportive people in my life that love me no matter what. Uh, so luckily the university I went to was only about an hour, hour, 15 minutes from my parents' house. So I went home a lot. Um, if I didn't have any obligations to the university that weekend, um, I would just go back and, and just have home cooked meals and sleep in my bed and do my laundry and um, just real quality family time. That's really how I'm wired anyways. It's like any spare time is family time. Uh, so that's what I personally needed to get through those challenging times because I think it's really important you surround yourself around positive people. And not not that I didn't have positive teammates, but it's like, you know, like they're going out and partying and, you know, life's good for them. And, and it wasn't for me and I wasn't doing that stuff. So um, mine was, you know, the retreat to home. Yeah, surround yourself with the right people, 100%. 100%. Um, I wanted to just touch on with with being a female swimmer, we were talking just before we started about how you do end up looking a certain way. It's so physical, your physique changes. And was there any challenges you faced on the way you perhaps need to be perceived how you looked um, mm-hmm. in society? Is there any advice you give to to young girls on on that sort of challenge that they may face in the pool, in and around the pool in their training? Yeah, I mean, that one's hard um, because I am very compassionate and empathetic to a lot of the women that I know really struggled with this. Um, again, I feel super blessed that I never really went through that challenging um, conflict that a, a lot of women have. I mean, first of all, we're in a sport, we're basically naked. Um, you know, stripping down to such a small little suit or such a tight little revealing suit. And, um, you know, I was always like pretty small for my age, but then I got to a point where I was just really buff and big shoulders and, and um, kind of thick, uh, being a distance swimmer. Uh, we just kind of see that body type more often. Um, and the only thing that I really felt embarrassed of was having really big shoulders. Uh, I think it was like, because I would always get dressed up for dances or different like activities, like outside the pool, you know, I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to put this dress on my shoulders, all like, Poof, you know, <laughs> so it took me a long time to really embrace that. Like, I feel like I still am, uh, but I do think our culture is changing a little bit. We're strong as sexy. Um, and that wasn't the case for quite some time. I feel like when I was swimming, it was like skinny as sexy. Um, but I think we're finally starting to embrace muscles. Um, you know, it, it, it's again, it's surrounding yourself around the right people. And sadly, a lot of it stems from your coaches, who your coaches are, what they're saying to you, if they're fat testing you, if, if they're, if they're calling you out for being large, um, you know, it's, um, it's a confidence thing. Right. And I also think that's the way you're raised. Like my parents raised me to have good confidence. And honestly, like when I look back at like older pictures, like, wow, I was kind of thick, you know, but back then I thought I was great. You know? <laughs> I was like, hey, um, I feel like it's something that I kind of have to keep myself in check with now. Like I, I really, um, you see a lot of professional athletes or Olympians that kind of lose shape after their sport. And you're like, wait, you were an Olympian and I don't want that to happen to me. Yeah. Um, so I feel like I kind of put that own pressure on myself. Um, and, and, you know, I'm just aware of how I feel or look in clothes and am putting on bathing suits. Cause it's like, 
you go out in a bathing suit and people are like, oh yeah, she's an Olympic swimmer. It's like, well, I kind of want to look like I was an Olympic swimmer for as long as I can, you know? Um, so that's something that I think it's, it's, it's not unhealthy though. Cause to me, um, I, that just makes me want to work out daily, which I think is an important, um, habit and just to eat properly. Um, I'm all about moderation. I am, um, I've changed my eating habits tremendously since swimming because when I was swimming, I was hungry all the time and would eat whatever I want. Um, I still feel like I could eat 24 seven. I just love to eat. I love food. Um, but it's learning, oh yeah, you're, you're done swimming. You can't do that anymore. Um, and then just making the right choices. Uh, I am very lucky that my husband is a nutritionist. So it comes a little bit easier for me just because I find too, like you eat like the people around you. Um, and, and my husband eats so clean and he's so healthy and he has such great habits that I follow those habits. Um, my, my boyfriend before I was married, I mean, he was a swimmer and he just ate anything and everything and just like, mm. I'm like, I could do that too. Cause I'm yeah. with him all the time. Right. And it's, so it's, it's definitely like, again, who you surround yourself around. And I just noticed that like, when I go to my parents' house, like they don't eat super healthy. So it's like, yeah, we're having like nachos for lunch and <laughs> like, you know, um, but again, I, all, I believe in all moderation, like nachos are my happy food. So I'm not going to deprive myself from those. Um, so it, 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 the whole, the whole body image, it's, it's, it, it's, it's very tragic because I see that it affects women a lot, but it also affects men. Um, mm. And I think that if people could be more accepting and compassionate, but also we just need to grow people's confidence. And unfortunately, I think a lot of that comes from social media where we get these unrealistic um, ideas in our head and we don't always keep in mind that everything is pretty much filtered and that celebrities have a lot of work done and things aren't really as real as they seem. So again, I think that ultimately stems from confidence, uh, but at the same time, I think it's it's about self, self-love self really. Yeah, that's that's so true for men, like regardless of sport, I think there's, there's this underlying uh, this undercurrent of pressure put on them for how they need to look they need to look a certain way and, and I think it does work both ways it really does and and being aware of like I think I, I really love that you have the identity of wanting to be a, an, an athlete and I think that you you take pride in that and I think that's something to recognize if you're a if you're a budding sportsman or an athlete then taking pride in that identity it's something that I do I I, I still work out I work I do my yoga I do my everything that is is just to build that identity around that's just who I am like that's just what I want to be but also I know it's good for me I also know it's so good for me in in the long long term um what sort of diet are you running on at the moment like that and and what sort of training are you doing now yeah um so I am I really have had a lot of success with intermittent fasting um again that comes and that's what he wrote his um, master's thesis on. Um, and for me, when I met him, when I started doing that, it, it night and day difference. Um, and I, I find my body adapts really well to it in alternating days with that. Um, I'm not really that hungry in the morning. Like I feel like we get so wired that you need to eat like this massive breakfast in the morning. And for me, I just don't need that. Um, so usually in that my morning consists of a glass of water with apple cider vinegar, um, black coffee. Um, I like to do a fasted workout. Uh, right now during quarantine, I um, purchased a spin bike because that's my favorite type of exercise. Um, so once the gyms closed, I started um, kind of missing that a lot. And I tried to put it off for a while because we were told like we were going to be like in this two week quarantine. I'm like, oh, okay. And then it turned into months and months. I'm like, okay, I just need to buy the spin bike. So um, yeah, I, I <laughs> set up in our living room so I can have it right in front of the TV and it keeps you distracted. Um, and so I like to do a faster workout. And then I usually have some type of keto bar after that. I love keto crisp. Mm. Um, and then, and it's not that we do a keto diet. It's just, I found a bar that I really like that's clean. Cause there's a lot of bars out there that aren't clean. Um, and then I'm, I'm not a big eater during the day. Like uh, maybe I'll have another bar or like this peely nut yogurt, um, hummus perhaps. And then come dinner, I'm just like, proteins, veggies. Mm. Uh, but we, we eat rather clean. Like my husband's like, Oh, my wife cooks all the time. I'm like, not really. Like I, I mean, I do, but it's like nothing elaborate. Like I, we cook some veggies, I cook a meat and like that's dinner. Oh, always an avocado. You have to have an avocado. Yeah. Um, and we usually split an apple for dessert and have try to find some type of little sweet chocolate that's relatively clean. And, and that's about it. But um, again, like I'm all about moderation. I love a good cheese and cracker board and um, I love pizza, you know, it goes mm. on and on, but I just try to really, um, you know, make it, a, it's almost like you indulge for like a celebration or a family meal yeah. or his yeah. birthday. You don't need to indulge every day. <laughs> yeah, that's what I do. That's the 
we're very similar in that regard. One, I've taken on intermittent fasting, nice. um, to, uh, and then I, I actually switched to more ketogenic. And oh, cool. once I started going in, now I'm actually I do a lot more running, so I'm clocking up sort of like 60, 60 to odd k's in a week. So that I've actually found a real benefit on teaching my body how to fat oxidize and how and how to utilize fat and and just doing fasted fasted um, workouts. So. Nice. I, I I really try to encourage a lot of people to to well one realize like the, the amount of carbohydrates that we are f- tr- sort of forced uh-huh. to eat um, and and obviously with America everything is a bit bigger and everything <laughs> is a bit larger <laughs> so it is it is it, it is really really about that moderation it's so true but also that high fat intake like that I found ketogenic style I don't, I wouldn't say that I'm on a on a ketogenic diet. But I yeah. would say, like, I, I'm aware of when I can I can either flip into a ketosis. Um, I'm kind of really keen to do a, a three to seven day fast. Like that's something that I've, like a long one. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to pick his brains on it. Do five love, days. Yeah, I would love I would love to pick his brains on that, and and that is um that's something that I'm really keen on doing, and just kind of getting the body into autophagy and and really yes. really 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 going into because I you just as an athlete you are literally told like food is fuel. And then yeah. this this calorie this output, and and then I think you neglect what is actually good for you, like right. what is the what is the periphery benefit that you get around your 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 food, and then then there can be a I believe there can be a holistic approach to nutrition as an athlete, high performance and well being at the same time. Right. Like yes. there there's there isn't there is an element of high performance. There's a lot of um, stuff out there to show that if you if you want to go into high performance sports say like the tour de france you are going to knock years off your life because it is such <laughs> a grueling thing on your body um I, I really encourage people to listen to peter atia's podcast the drive like he's got some amazing stuff on on high performance and nutrition but yeah when as soon as i went into a ketogenic style diet and high fat my energy levels changed i was able to run better like i didn't feel definitely didn't feel run down I definitely didn't yeah. feel tired and i think for people getting that perpetual cycle like you said wake up in the morning eat mm-hmm. wake um i feel hungry eat something with high carbohydrate levels and they think or they're sold that idea through media through tv through marketing on packaging and stuff like that this right. is what you need and and it's so good to go to to that almost high fat low carb end of it because that's what your body can can deal with yeah. Well, it's funny. Like when I eat clean, I feel really good. <laughs> when I don't, I don't feel good. <laughs> Who'd have thought <laughs> it? <laughs> Who'd have thought it? <laughs> yeah. And you're, you're right. Like look good, uh, look good, feel good. I believe as well. Like there's, if you can yeah. take that, if you can take pro- that, there's that pride that you get, like I'm looking after myself that by eating well, I'm genuinely looking after myself. And then that transfers into, I care about myself and that, turns into pride about yourself and then that that might turn into an upkeep of that pride and and that's then maybe when a drive is ignited into something else in your life and and all from simply what you're putting in in your mouth like the the food you're eating and and the the drink as well like alcohol i think moderate like i use it as a thing i will only really drink to celebrate if i'm celebrating something for someone then that's when i will i will drink but there's no need for me to to smash beers and wine just right. when when it feels like it. Um, right, and I've like found something. all like the cleaner alcohols too. Like I only yeah. really, like high fermented um, uh, kombucha, so like witchcraft and like clean crafted wines. Like we just yeah. everybody you guys are such little hippies. I was like, well, that's just I feel better because I don't wake up hungover and it's like I'm actually drinking basically kombucha but it's a high alcohol and it's like it has all these like health benefits and it's like wines are great right but there's so much crap in wine so i find that found like a um a clean crafted wine company and it's like okay you know so i just think there's so there's options to everything it's if you choose and and yeah everything is more expensive when you live this way but Mm. what's the price of your life and the quality of your life and the longevity of your life yeah yeah i think that's especially in america with health the healthcare system like where you will pay for it even here in australia there is you pay for a lot more through the healthcare system and i and i just literally see it as this is an investment this yes. is an investment that i don't have to do down the line hopefully um there is some stuff that just happens to you and that and it, it's in it's directly affected you might get like injured some way shape or form but if if you're in control of that health essentially then then it is 
don't come don't don't be surprised if that that healthcare bill is a little bit more expensive yeah um yeah it's such a fascinating area look i don't want to take too much of your time i've got a couple more questions and one one that i would really like to ask is if you had one piece of advice for young athletes people up and coming or just anyone in general about how to work on that mental strength Mm. um what would be that that one bit of advice that you believe would help keep people mentally strong Mm -hmm. That's really tough because obviously there's so many different avenues you can go to, but I think it all comes down to just belief in yourself. A lot of people are afraid and like when they get behind the blocks at the starting or like the beginning of a game and it's like, well, you need to dissect like what it is you're afraid of. And so one of the things that I I share is that I feel like I was really good from a young age because I was never afraid to fail because I always felt unconditionally loved. And because I knew that I had my parents' love no matter what, I wasn't afraid to put myself out there. Um, and and I, I would see as a coach, and even when I was racing, like kids would be like crying after races. I'm like, why are they crying? It's like, obviously they're crying because they felt like they let somebody down. They're not crying for themselves. And so it's like, that starts at the top. Like that starts from your parents. So if any parents are listening or if any children are listening, it's like your self-worth is not determined off of how you swim or race or compete or score. It's I mean, the house I came in, your self-worth was off of being a good person, you know, and, yeah. and loving others and being compassionate. So I feel like we need to keep in check, like what, what you think it is that is holding, what, what would, what would it be from holding you back? And it's, it's always, you're afraid of something, so there's nothing really to be afraid of. I mean, it's literally a sport, like <laughs> go out there and do it and then like move on. Like there's something else to do after that. Or if it wasn't a good swim, you have another one. Um, so I think that that's kind of like a big light bulb moment. I feel like when I'm talking to swimmers or parents, it's like you have to be able to either show your kid or as a, if you're a kid, you have to know that your parents love you no matter what, first place, last place, DQ. And as a parent, you need to be able to show your child that you don't care first place, last place. I mean, obviously you want them to win, but at the same time, you're not going to love them less when they don't. Uh, So I think that's really important. I think that's knowing what would be holding you back would be being afraid of something. So you have to be able to call yourself out on what you know, what that might be. And I think a lot of time it is like your self-worth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, like I yeah. The words. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I think it leads to the, who you, what your identity is, and I would yes. always say like figure out who you want to be first, the, rather than what you want to be. Um, I remember when I was, we would do these team meetings where we would do. It was almost like speed dating throughout the team. It was a really great exercise where we would we would say to each each of us on the team, it was all about building a stronger team, and we would ask each other, um, or we would tell each other like I this is a bit of um, motivational feedback for you. And this is then a bit of developmental feedback for you. And you were very, we, we'd done a few weeks of it and it was all about like being able to give that info in a certain way. Like if I knew someone was quite direct and I, I felt they were selfish, I couldn't go, you're selfish because <laughs> they would just fire it straight back at me. So we learned how to communicate that to them. But one of the things that came back to me was everyone would say like, Lewis, you're so driven, you're so driven. I'm like, ah, I want people to say that I'm good at this skill or that skill. And I'm like, that is really annoying. And like, I want to be good at this, that and the other, but I'm, they're telling me I'm driven. And it wasn't until I had that realization that, well, actually that's a great skill to have. Like being driven means that then it doesn't really matter what I'm focusing on that I will be driven to do, that, that I'll be driven to succeed in that. So the what can, it wasn't really about the what, it was about who I was. And then I really accept that as a great bit of feedback because I was working on the skill set of who I wanted to be rather than what I wanted to be. The what was still there, so there was a, a, a goal, but who I wanted to be was far more. I, I wanted to go into the community and help out the community because I wanted to give back to those people. Mm-hmm. I wanted to to give people my time. I wanted to go and find out people's names who potentially were other people working in the in the business of the sport and and understand them and and learn about those people and rather than just solely focus on what I was trying to become and and that skill has now helped me outside of sport and transitioned outside and and I I believe that's going to help me and others that I've seen that have done similar stuff in in what they do moving forward. I think that's a skill for people to learn whether it's sport business whatever that they 
they learn that of who they want to be first rather than than what they want to become yeah uh, how did how did you deal with uh, obviously went to Olymp- you went to the olympics gold silver bronze medals everywhere and where how did you deal with your successes and your failures in a sense so was there um was there a way you stayed like up or was there how did you stay even keeled is what i'm trying yeah. to say how did you stay grounded that's a great question um <laughs> if I was unhappy with a swim, I'd get really quiet and just didn't really need to talk to anybody. And I just needed to be in my own space. Uh, I had a college coach say, I like when you, I like when you have a bad swim. I'm like, why would you ever say that? And he's like, cause I know your next one's going to be even better. Um, so I used that to like, get me going for the next one. Like I'd get pissed. And so like, I would take it out on my next race. That's the good thing about swimming. It usually you go to a meet and there's multiple races or you have meets, you know, three days in a row, two days in a row, sometimes five Olympic trials are like eight, you know, so you have these meets to rebound the next day. Um, and I always got better as the meets went along also, but I think that was like kind of like my endurance. Um, and, and when I had a great swim, it was the same thing. It channeled onto the next one. It really sets a tone. Um, and I think I would just get like on a, on a roll and it would almost just kind of like be that snowball effect that the next one got better than the next one got better. And I was on a club team where we would go to meets and we would swim as many as they would allow us. And then in college, you know, I kind of swam a little bit of everything. My coach put me in everything I was allowed to same thing. And then in, in my post-grad career and my professional career, I swam a bunch of events. So I didn't just like really specialize in one. So I always had a lot to like work for and, and race. Um, so I, I feel like I channeled the energy good or bad to make the next one even better. Mm. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's amazing and finally look taking up so much of your time i really appreciate it and the the last the last question i wanted to ask was if you what was the what would be the one piece of adversity that you had that you would wish not to go through again but (laughs) served you in the good served you for good in the long run oh man I would say that, okay, so I'm born and raised in Southern California in this area called Orange County. And basically people like joke, like people never leave Orange County. It's like a bubble. Um, It's beautiful. The beaches, um, everything, just good restaurants, good weather. You're you're, we're like right now, like I'm five minutes from the beach, but I'm like an hour from the desert, two hours from the mountains. Like we just live like in a really amazing location. Um, And then I went to school in a county next. So I went to LA County from Orange County. So you're still in Southern California. And then when I was done at USC, um, I was going to continue swimming and I didn't really know where to go because there wasn't a lot of programs for um, postgraduates or just professional women. There wasn't really any in the sport. So I had to, I actually had to pack up and move to Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is completely on the other side of the map. It's really cold. It snows all the time. They have four seasons. It's it really, really hot and humid. It gets really, really cold and icy. Uh, I didn't know hardly anybody. I had hardly any friends there. Uh, and I'll never forget when my mom took me to the airport. My dad couldn't even come because he was so sad. My mom dropped me off and I went, I cried the whole entire flight. I was like, what am I doing? This is ridiculous. I can't believe I would move across the country for a sport. And I was like, why would I ever leave Orange County? Why would I leave my family? And I was like, I can't, I'm not getting emotional thinking about it. I was so sad and scared, but then looking back on it and it was kind of a rough go in the beginning there. Like I was like, oh my god, it's so cold. Like everything was just hard. Um, but looking back, it's like one of the best things I've ever done because I really got outside of my comfort zone. Um, I really just going to a place where I really didn't know anybody or anything, and just made friends and really felt like I stepped into womanhood more because I feel like even though I went to college, like I relied on my parents so much. Um, you know, in, in Michigan, like I owned my house and I really did my own laundry and I had in my own kitchen and, you know, I was making adult relationships and um, I don't, moving to Michigan, I didn't have the best swimming career, but I had the, the best stage of growing up. I feel like, like it really forced me to grow up. So looking back on it, I was like, this was the worst decision ever. It was such like a huge obstacle to overcome and like huge like adversity as far as I got sick a lot moving there because of like my allergies and my asthma. And I, I felt like I got like seasonal depression. Like it was just so different for where I was born and raised. But like my sister always says, cause my sisters have never left Orange County and they're like, 
my sisters are worried that they're gonna like you know die and be like I never left Orange County and they're like it's so cool that you did that you know and mm. so I'm, I'm proud to say that I I, I did that <laughs> yeah wow get out of get out of your environment and, yeah. and challenge yourself I mean again same thing like get uncomfortable go find someplace where that growth can happen even if it uh-huh. wasn't the physical side that's um that's awesome look Caitlin thank you so much for your for your yeah, time you. um where's the you obviously have a book golden glow so yeah. i will i'll leave a link in the show notes for that um tell us a little bit about that book what what, what is in there what can people expect from it yeah, honestly, kind of everything we talked about, the highs, the lows, everything in between, how I was raised, uh, you know, life during my, the the pinnacle of my sport and the harder times through my sport, the nitty gritty, um, a lot of like um, just actual accounts from old teammates and friends and coaches, um, training for the third Olympics, it didn't happen. And then life after swimming, you know, trying to find your identity, what it is that fills up your passion cup. I do a lot of nonprofit work for this charity called the Jesse Reese Foundation, which also goes by Team Migu and E G U, and it stands for Never Ever Give Up. It's all about spreading wow. hope, joy, and love to children fighting cancer. So tying in the little girl who started this foundation and how she left her impact on my heart, and how I've tried to continue it, um, what she started after she passed away. Um, so just a lot about like giving back and making a difference, and trying to empower people to make a difference. Um, and then yeah, it's it's kind of like my a whole last 37 of my years of my life in in, in a nutshell yeah. <laughs> the pictures. Well, like, <laughs> yeah like i said i'll leave a link in the show notes for that um and where else if people want to find you want to reach out to you where's the best place for them to do that uh yeah caitlin sandino on instagram twitter facebook um and then i think i'm connected to sandino swim at gmail for any uh, just emails and just kind of chat to people i i put myself out there for the most part but um, i find as i'm getting older i'm starting to be more and more less attracted to social media and i just think social media is getting so out of hand but i'm definitely on it um i do like to connect with fans i do like to be able to be um you know approachable um and unfortunately fortunately i think that is through social media so yeah you can find me at caitlin zandano yeah, it's the best worst thing to happen, isn't it? Just, uh, that's <laughs> almost sometimes. sometimes. <laughs> Look, Caitlin, thank you again so much for your time. This thank has you. been amazing. Your energy is awesome, and oh, uh, yeah, if anyone, you. I really encourage people to to reach out to you if they they feel there's something in here that has hit home or have any yeah. questions. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Yeah, yeah, take good care. Be safe out there. And uh, here's to 2021. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> take care. Cheers. <laughs>